You ready? All right, welcome. Let's get started. Thank you for being here on campus, or for those of us who, those of you who are streaming live from home, thank you very much. Anybody here who is here on campus tonight gets $100 off their tuition next year. <laughs> the schedule for tonight, well, let me tell you initially how this started at the School Advisory Committee back in October and November. We were talking about uh, Regis and things and how rumors start and and they were questioning me about how things really are and one of the ideas from one of the parents was to have a state of the school evening where we could talk about the directions of the school the budget and then take questions afterwards so tonight we have tony nays our board chair here tonight he'll talk about this strategic plan and major initiatives of the school from the board level then Gretchen Kessler, the girls' division principal, and Alan Carruthers, the boys' division principal, will talk about educational initiatives, uh, the direction the school's going, and then uh, topics that are hot and current here in terms of uh, the students. Then I'll finish with an overview of the budget and try to give you as much information about that as I can without getting down into the weeds, future directions for our facilities. My hope is that takes between 45 minutes and an hour, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience here on campus. And then we also have students. Uh, Stephanie Lort Lorenti is a senior broadcasting student. She'll be our MC host for the Twitter feed and email questions coming from the people at home. So let's, let's begin with Tony Nays, who's been the board chair throughout the year and has directed the whole strategic uh, plan process. Uh, thanks, Rick. Thanks for the great introduction. And I just want to recognize a couple folks uh, before we get going. And I'm going to walk around with this, if you don't mind, so I can see the slides. Um, first of all, I am the chairman of the board, as Rick said. Uh, we have uh, a few board members here. I know at least one, Emily. And I, uh, if you guys know any of the board members, are familiar with them, uh, I just think it's a great opportunity to thank them for their work. Uh, they give a lot of time, talent, and treasure. They uh, assist me as the chair. I don't really do any of the work. They do all the work, and I get to take all the credit for it. So if you know a board uh, member, please uh, take the opportunity to thank them for their service because it's significant. We've been doing a lot of work, and they're the ones that are really getting it done. And Emily, thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate it. I also want to recognize the three folks on the stage, the uh, two principals, Alan and Gretchen, and Rick, who's our interim president, who have done an outstanding job this year, continue to, the school is running very well, uh, like a greased machine, and uh, it's because we have great leaders in place doing the blocking and tackling on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which is great. So we're, we're lucky to have them, and I just uh, wanted to take a few minutes to recognize those, uh, those folks on stage. So tonight, as Rick said, we're going to spend about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, to giving you an update. Uh, the items that we're going to talk about are up there, strategic planning, an educational update, and then a financial overview. And I'm here to talk about the strategic plan, so I'll get rolling with that, because Rick has me on the clock. <clears throat> uh, so our strategic plan process started about two years ago in February of 2014. This is the current strategic plan. The existing strategic plan at the time we decided to start this process was about seven to nine years old. It, uh, we decided to take a very broad approach to the strategic planning process. We involved about 300 people. Some of you may have been involved in the focus groups that we put together to gather data to create the strategic plan. Uh, so we took a very broad approach. I, I really was an advocate for that uh, as opposed to a very narrow approach, uh, which you can do. You can take a, just a board-only approach. Uh, because I thought we would get some pearls of wisdom if we opened uh, up the data gathering to a bunch of people, all the constituents of Regis, including feeder schools and um, comp competitive high schools. So we had about 300 folks involved in that process. Uh, from that data gathering process, which basically included getting people together and saying, what do you see as Regis's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? From that work, we put together what's called the SWOT analysis, that which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, based on all the feedback that we received. We used those data points to create a strategic plan. 
uh, with five strategic initiatives. And these have been published. We've talked about them in uh, the red and white. I think they're on the website. Uh, but the uh, strategic initiatives specifically were put together to make our strength stronger and to address opportunities w that we thought we might have, as well as addressing potential weaknesses and threats that might be facing the school in the next five to ten years. A strategic plan is meant to be a five to ten year plan. Uh, that process culminated uh, last fall and then early um, uh, last spring, spring of 2015, in our strategic plan, which is, was approved by the board in June of 2015. And at that same board meeting, we decided we were going to take a look at mission vision values of the school, not because the existing mission vision values weren't appropriate, but because it had been 20 years since we had updated the mission vision values. Uh, so we decided to uh, take some steps in that direction. Father Tom Rochford, who is the chair of our Ignatian Identity Committee, uh, did that work. And we'll take a, a look at uh, the current mission here on the next page. Uh, the mission vision values overarches the strategic initiatives. So everything we do from a strategic perspective over the next five to ten years should fit under the arch of our mission, vision, and values. And if we look at our current mission, vision, and values, I'll let you read that. Uh, for about 30 seconds. Mo I'm sure most of you have it memorized. So you can share it on the elevator. It's part of your elevator speech. Uh, I think the Mission Vision Values does a great job of articulating what we do here at Regis. We're a Catholic Jesuit institution, and uh, we've got some nice Jesuit words in there around service and uh, justice. Um, and, it, you know, it, it says we educate and we have an excellent institution. So it's, a, it's a, an appropriate strategic plan mission statement. But it's also 20 years old, and it was created uh, prior to a girls' division being here on, on campus. So there's really no mention of educating both young men and young women. And we felt that, that it was appropriate to update it. Father Tom has done a great job with that work, and he has um, proceeded to the point where I think in June of this year we'll probably approve a new uh, and improved, hopefully, mission, vision, value statement for the school. Many of you may have had an opportunity to see some of the drafts that have been going around uh, because Tom has uh, engaged a lot of people in that process. Uh, but if not, shortly after the June board meeting, we will have every intention of communicating that with uh, the broader community. And it will, you know, hopefully be in place for the next 10 to 15 years until we update the strategic plan one more time. So let's talk about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that were identified as part of our strategic planning process when we gathered data from our 300 folks that participated in the focus groups. Uh, these won't look surprising to you, and I'm not going to spend time going through every one of them. You can read through them yourself. I'll touch on the ones that are highlighted. So if we look at strengths, and I think it's really good to address this <clears throat> every time I have the opportunity or uh, maybe anybody on the stage has the opportunity. You know, single gender education is a huge benefit at this school and is broadly supported based on the data that we gathered from the focus groups. Everybody supported it. In, in fact, uh, there were no negative comments about single-sex education through our data gathering process. It was widely identified as a strength. So we have every intention of keeping Regis a single-sex education school. As a board member and chair, I can tell you, not that it needs to be said, because I don't think I've heard any recent rumors, but um, single-sex education is, is the bomb. And we're going to continue to do it here at Regis Jesuit. Uh, weaknesses, you know, one of the things that you get out of a broader process is a, a pearl of wisdom or two, hopefully, because a broader process that includes more people is more time consuming. Um, it uh, obviously is more expensive uh, and it involves a lot more people. But hopefully, you pick up one or two pearls of wisdom through the process that you wouldn't have gotten if you had had a narrower process. And I think one of the pearls of wisdom we got was the feedback that our marketing and branding and communications here at Regis isn't probably what we think it, it is or could be, uh, and we can certainly improve. So uh, that's going to turn into one of our strategic initiatives that we'll see on the next slide. And I don't think we would have gotten that through a very narrow board uh, focused process. I think the community is what brought that uh, to light. Under opportunities, 
uh, we've got STEAM, which is probably more familiar term is STEM. STEM programming is available in most secondary education uh, institutions in Colorado, and it's very common throughout the country. Uh, we are putting our toes into the water there, but it was widely identified through the uh, focus group process that we should be thinking about STEM uh, curriculum here, which is a project-based learning program, and I know Alan and Gretchen are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we added an A to it, and the A isn't for and. A lot of people think, you know, it's you've, you've put the and between, uh, you know, engineering and math. It start, stands for arts, so that we can take advantage of facilities like this and our talented teachers that uh, provide arts education. So we want project-based learning in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math uh, to be introduced here at Regis and to evolve, just like it is in the public school arenas. We want to make sure we're competitive and we can offer the same kind of programming that you can get anywhere. Uh, so Alan and Gretchen will provide a little bit more detail on that. Then under threats, a couple things, key employee loss and cost control on the tuition side, two things that uh, are very near and dear to just about everybody's heart. You know, we hire for mission, we train, develop, and our teachers teach for mission, and we want to keep them, and we don't want to, them to have a reason to leave us. Uh, it was identified, you know, we are currently probably about 90 to 91 percent for the most part, uh, our teachers compared to peer teachers at other secondary education institutions here in Colorado, uh, which incidentally is significantly better than it was a couple uh, chairmans ago. I think we started in the low 70s, maybe. Uh, is that right, Rick? Uh, in terms of 77. So, you know, we've tracked from 77% to 91%, which is great, but we know we need to do better uh, in order to make sure we're retaining our key folks. Uh, cost and tuition and escalation, we need to be affordable. When folks have an opportunity to send their kids to a public school for free, um, we know that cost control is essential, and we, we can't do cost control at the expense of quality programming in the classroom or on the athletic field or um, in activities. We have to be competitive in all those areas, and we need to maintain our costs so that the school remains um, at least available to the majority of the folks in the, um, in the metro area. So those were identified as the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now we took that data and spent a Saturday talking about, okay, what are our strategic initiatives in order to make sure that our strengths stay strong and that we're taking advantage of our opportunities and we're addressing our weaknesses and threats what are our strategic initiatives? You, never, you don't want to have too many of these because if you have too many, there's no way you can get them all done. And remember, these are five to 10 year initiatives. These are not going to be done overnight. So we've got the five strategic initiatives that are in bold, and then the pillars that really are a little bit more detailed information about our strategic plan. How am I doing on time, Rick? What's that? I'm OK, OK. Um, so uh, the strategic initiatives are listed there in bold, and then the pillars are underneath them. And those are, as I said, you peel back the onion, that's really what we're trying to achieve. So some examples, under excellence, we want to be excellent in all things that we do. That's for our students, for our faculty, and our alumni. So it, those are the pillars. And if we think about one of the weaknesses uh, we had was, um, Oh, what was the weakness that we talked about? Oh, well, let's talk about an opportunity. Uh, STEAM, we want to launch STEAM. So that for students, in order to be excellent, if you peel back the onion for the students, one of the ac action plans that we're going to do to ensure that is we're going to launch STEAM. That will make sure that our student experience is as good as it can be. It's competitive with the other secondary education opportunities in Colorado, and it will help us to make sure that we're providing an excellent education for our students. For faculty, as a threat, we acknowledged um, uh, loss of key personnel. So one of the things we're doing for faculty is uh, we're doing a number of things. I think you're going to talk about the RJ way, um, which is a way to you know manage, uh, assess, and, and mentor our teachers so that they get better in the classroom. Um, and we're also looking at compensation. I mentioned the 90 to 91 percent, which is where we're at today. 
we're, we're, we're figuring out as a board, okay, where do we need to get? It's probably not 100% of competition. It's probably better than 91, but we're going to figure that out. And in order to make this an excellent place for our faculty, we're going to get there. So maybe it's 95%. I don't know, but we'll figure that out over the next six to nine months, and then we'll put a plan in place to get there. Uh, diversity and inclusion. You know, basically what we want on diversity and inclusion is for Regis to look like the community in which we exist. Uh, and we, while this is listed as a weakness, as you saw in the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, I would say it's a strengthening weakness without a doubt. Uh, we have now probably gotten past the mid-20s in terms of uh, diversity percentage here at this school. And the incoming freshman class in August will be the most diverse class that we've had here since we've been down on the south side, uh, which is great. I mean, it, we've made it intentional to make sure that uh, we're making progress in diversity and inclusion. And people that have the ability to come here from all areas of the metro area uh, will be admitted and we'll have a means uh, to get them here, even if it means a little bit of financial aid, uh, we'll be able to do that. Uh, marketing, communications, and branding. So this is the, the pearl of wisdom that we got. Uh, we noted as a weakness, uh, branding and communications. Uh, we formed a committee specifically to address this. And uh, the committee is chaired by Ellen Canary, uh, who's on the board. And they are making sure that uh, our brand is well known, that you know, Catholic school enrollment is dropping. We know our feeder school population is gonna have to increase. Last year, we actually increased our feeder schools, I think, by 12. We had 12 new feeder schools sending kids to our, our school last year with the enrollment, with admissions in the last class. We're going to need to continue to do that. Developing the brand is important. Internal and external communications, we heard this through the uh, focus group feedback. We need to be better at communicating. So we've got a committee that is working on improving communications both inside these four walls and outside because we want to be transparent and communicative to all of our constituent groups. So we're working on that. And remember, these are all long-term issues. This isn't going to be stuff that's fixed overnight. Infrastructure and master planning. Uh, so all the things we want to do require equipment and facilities. And you, you can't build a building like this. You can't plan it, raise the money for it, and build it overnight. It takes time. So we have a major planning committee that um, is focused on putting together a master plan. And I expect to see that here in the next few months. Um, and we're going to talk about what we need to do over the next five to 10 years, prioritize with estimates of costs. And we'll decide you know, how we get this done. A STEAM program probably will require some kind of new facilities, new equipment, in order to do it effectively. So uh, you know, that's part of the plan. And we have uh, a committee specifically assigned to do that work. Uh, then comprehensive financial strategy ties it all together. Uh, we put together a five-year and 10-year financial model that says, OK, if we do everything we want to do under these strategic initiatives, what's it going to cost? What does it do to tuition? Is tuition still affordable? It has to be. That's not an option. Uh, how much money do we need to raise for capital projects and for endowment? We put it all into a model. And if it, it doesn't give us the result we're looking for, then we have to go through an iterative process to get it there. Uh, so you know, the comprehensive financial strategy piece, that, that model is really being worked by Rhonda Maroney, our CFO, and also um, uh, Larry Finch, who's the, uh, the chair of our Audit and Finance Committee. A couple other things under that, that strategic uh, initiative are growing our endowment and looking at efficiencies in the school, making sure that we're being good stewards for the tuition dollars that we get. So those were the seven strategic initiatives. They're all on the website. I think uh, Sharice Broderick King has posted them all there. So, And there's a little bit more information there as well if you want to look at some of the details. I'm not going to talk about all of these specific uh, current activities because we've touched on many of them. But these are some of the specific action plans now that are below the pillars that are helping to make sure we're getting this stuff implemented over the next five to 10 years. The one that I will talk about is the optimal organizational structure because it touches on the communication piece that was identified as a weakness. 
uh, we have engaged a consultant uh, to help us look at our organizational structure, make sure that it's, it's the best organizational structure that we can have to support a school with two divisions for the next five to 10 years. And the thing that's, you know, that's interesting about this is we're really, we're, chart we're in uncharted waters here. There are no other secondary education schools with two divisions. Uh, and you know, we're learning as we're going. But we've got 10 years of history that we can rely upon. And we've got a guy who's helping us by the name of Jack Peterson, who's excellent at what he does. And we started the process in March, uh, did some data gathering. We'll continue to do that in the fall when we get our new president on board, Dave Card. And I would suspect about this time next year, we'll probably have some uh, feedback on how that looks. And you know, the, one of the answers, one of the potential outcomes clearly is we could stay exactly how we are. It could be that the organizational structure we have today is the best we can do if we want to be a single sex education school. And we have to live with maybe some of the lack of communication or inefficiencies in the communication process because we want to be a single sex education school. But we're looking at that because we think there may be some opportunity. Um, and you know we'll see how that ends. I think sometime next spring we'll probably be able to provide a little bit of, of uh, feedback. And we'll give feedback as we go through the process, uh, making sure that we keep the community involved. Um, so that's it for me. That's the strategic plan where it currently sits. I'm going to turn it over to, I think, Alan and Gretchen. Gretchen, I would say if anything I mentioned uh, is, is a passion of yours, I'd love to have you contact me. We are definitely looking for folks to help at the committee level to do the work of implementing the strategic plan. And if you've got an interest, take down my number or my email and let me know and I'll get you assigned to the appropriate committee because we are looking for worker bees. And with that, here you go. You want this in here? And I'm going to follow my notes because if I don't, I'm guaranteed to forget something I want to say. So thank you for coming this evening. And I will be addressing three topics, topics of interest, um, none of which are related to one another. First, I'd like to share some information about the formation of our teachers. We have always had a very robust training and formation, or what you might call evaluation program. As far as training, Every new teacher begins with the week of training before school begins, followed by monthly formation meetings in which we cover teaching techniques, reviews of our school rules and regulations, as well as instruction on Ignatian education. Each new teacher has a number of people working with him or her throughout the year, a department chair, a mentor, and an administrator. We also have a number of Wednesday morning meetings that range from divisional faculty meetings to department meetings to spirituality mornings to other training. Frequently, those discussions that happen in department meetings are directly related to instruction. We have an in-service day each semester that usually covers a variety of instructional topics that are timely for us. The first-year teachers also attend a three-day retreat with all of the first-year uh, teachers from the different schools in our province uh, in Kansas City, accompanied by an administrator reflector from each school. We've recently revised our formation process. And just to explain the basics of it, our formation team worked with uh, data collected from our faculty, as well as a document that's created by the Jesuit Schools Network called the Profile of an Ignatian Educator. And from that, they formulated professional teaching standards for us. These standards are a guideline to keep us growing as Ignatian educators. Each standard has many benchmarks associated with it. To give you just the basics, standard one is entitled Exhibits Cura Personalis, which means care of the individual. Standard two is discern ways of teaching in Ignatian education. Modeling Ignatian Pedagogy is standard three, and that's the one that we have focused on this year in the first year of using our new system. It has been described as the Ignatian educator creates a classroom environment that is conducive to learning and fosters a culture of active learning and student engagement, 
focusing on student success, and multiple approaches to checking for understanding that impacts instruction. A lot of educational jargon, but it's good. Standard four is builds community and fosters healthy and supportive relationships. And standard five, the last one, is entitled Animates the Ignatian Vision. And that focuses on the fact that the person has made an active choice to work in this unique, faith-filled context, and that person embraces this vocation and educational mission. And isn't that what we want all of our teachers and all of our staff to be doing? I don't want to overwhelm you with too much detail of our process, but we are now using an online program called iObservation, which we are adapting to our five standards. As each administrator or department chair makes a class visit, the person is able to check the items observed and make comments of support and suggestion. The report of each visit is immediately available to the teacher and we ask for feedback from them as well. All reports and comments are maintained on the cloud, thank God for the cloud, and now available as cumulative information for the teacher in the school. In the past, we relied on paper. I, uh, teachers used to get notes when I would do drop-ins, but there was no formal record of those notes. They got a long written report the years that they were on formal formation, a copy of which went into their um, HR files. Now the reports, both formal and informal, are saved to the cloud and there's an ongoing trail. Previously, we did formation in years one, two, five, and then multiples of five. Now we've moved it up a little and are doing formal observations years one, two, four, and multiples of four. Informal observations from an administrator and a department chair are done every year, and goal setting is also done every year. Just as we want our students to keep growing, we as Ignatian educators want to keep growing, and our process encourages us to do that and to hold us to certain expectations. Our first year in this new process has gone very well. In a national poll done last year, teens reported that the top four problems they face are drugs, pressure to succeed, pressure to look good, and depression. 20 years ago, none of those were on the list. Those results are sobering regarding your children and the students with whom we work. And we certainly see those same problems evidenced in some of their lives. This is a fast-paced world in which this generation is exposed to things in middle, uh, this generation is exposed to things in middle school, like alcohol and drugs, that we might not have been exposed to until high school or college. They're not always developmentally ready for what they experience. They live in a world where they're barraged by images of the perfect and the successful that are not at all realistic and honestly fairly warped. Media tells them they can only be happy if they've got the perfect body, the perfect grades, the perfect relationship, and the perfect job. Images like that are amplified for girls and we are constantly fighting those images, showing the girls that they are all, every one of them, made in God's image and likeness, and that they are beautiful inside and out, just the way they are. We do this through opportunities in classes, activities on retreats, messages in homilies, and hundreds of other ways to sway the culture's messages. We are blessed with an amazing faculty and staff that pay attention to what our students are saying and doing, and personal counselors who work closely with the students and frequently with you parents. In case you haven't noticed, girls tend to be per perfectionists, leading to greater levels of stress. We as adults know that stress and, and anxiety are harmful to us in a variety of ways, including physically and psychologically. It is to our teenagers, too. Lack of balance in life frequently leads to stress. Finding balance in life is just not the message that uh, the world gives to any of us, and teens take it to heart. Whether it's taking five AP classes, playing school and club sports, or being constantly on the go, there are a few who can balance all that they're doing and do it well. And here's a scary statistic for you. According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, the rate of mental health disorders such as anxiety and depression has increased by up to 70% among adolescents in the past 10 years. 
and the chance that 15-year-olds will have issues such as substance abuse, eating disorders, and self-injury have more than doubled in that same time frame. It's something we all need to pay attention to in our own lives as well as our children's. We're sure that you pay attention to it at home, and we're paying attention to it here, and we're working with you to take care of your kids. Third topic, which has absolutely nothing to do with the first two, 21st century classroom. As many of you know, we have had sample new furniture in one classroom in each division this year. There are many reasons for looking for something new. Our present furniture is bulky and not easy to move around, but more importantly, we're paying attention to the type of activity that's being done in our classrooms. Research tells us that we need to prepare students to have certain skills for the world into which they will go. They need to be communicators, collaborators, problem solvers, and reflective critical thinkers, and that's for starters. Our classrooms need to be more flexible than they have been in the past, allowing space for independent work, collaborative work, and group instruction. We've done a lot of research and visited a variety of schools to see what they are using and have found models that we think will meet our needs. Comfortable, versatile, and movable furniture is what we're looking for. So this year we have tested some mo more mobile furniture in two classrooms, including desks in a wedge shape, chairs with armrests and padding, which are the kids' favorite if you haven't heard it already, and some stand-up desks in the boys' division. We have gotten feedback from the teachers and students, which is very positive. Although we discovered that the square footage of the classrooms in the girls' division, the, the furniture that we presently have needs to be smaller. Um, we're about 200 square feet less per room than the boys' division is. So we're looking now at a smaller desk size for next year so we can continue to experiment with a different version of what we had this year. Over the next few years, we'll be very deliberate in the work and in our efforts to find the best mix of furniture to meet the needs of the work that we're doing in the classroom and to replace the old furniture in a sensible time frame. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Alan Crothers, and uh, I'm going to talk about a few different topics tonight. The first one we're going to talk about, Gretchen touched on already, and that is uh, the whole idea of caring for adolescents. Uh, anybody, was any of the moms out there, were you at the Moms Club meeting when I talked a few nights back? So I'm going to touch on some of those same ideas, so I apologize if I repeat myself, and I certainly wouldn't go in as in-depth as I did that evening. But as Gretchen said, we have some real challenges that our students are facing. Uh, she mentioned quite a few, particularly for that apply to young women. Uh, we, the young men also are facing some of those similar challenges, but in some different ways. And part of this stems from, obviously, uh, our modern world. It stems from our parenting techniques, and I mean my own as well, uh, that we all are reflecting upon, I think. And it also is based upon what's happening around them on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the key elements that I think that are important to understand is our kids are faced with a world where it's a one strike, you're out type of perception. Uh, we've taught them that. Uh, they really feel, particularly kids who are high performing kids, and all of your children are high performing. They're at Regis Jesuit. Uh, this school has very stringent uh, academic and acceptance standards. And when our kids come to us, they've already been under a tremendous amount of pressure. We have kids coming from gifted and talented programs. We have kids coming from stellar private schools and high-performing Catholic schools. And what we know is that those numbers that Gretchen talked about with uh, depression and anxiety uh, also high-risk behaviors goes up about 300 percent when it is looked at simply to at the high performing student level. So high performing student levels have three times more likelihood of high risk behaviors as well as depression and anxiety. So one of the things that we've noticed I think over the last few years is our kids don't talk about stress. They don't talk about uh, being sad. They talk about, they talk about depression and anxiety. Now part of it is the words that we're using in our communities, it's part of the, what they hear on television, it's part of what they hear in their own youth culture. What that does is it, it turns it into a medicinal question. 
So what happens is we see many kids then trying to self-medicate. Now self-medication can be everything from addiction to technology, uh, to drugs and alcohol, to a variety of other things. One of the issues for boys across this country, uh, not just here at Regis Jesuit but all places, is the issue with online pornography, which then of course does affect relationships and young women and perceptions of healthy relationships and one's own personal sexuality as well as that of others. So all of this creates tremendous complexities. I don't think there's a time in history where schools, uh, particularly a school like ours, and parents need to be in deeper communication. And one of the greatest things we see is parents are often embarrassed, stressed out, on how to bring major issues forward to the school. And yet we have to be partners in those things. We've had almost 40 young men and women this year who have been hospitalized and treated for suicidal ideation. That's an alarming number. Uh, I've been in, this, in, in Jesuit education for about 22 years. Um, I never thought in my career I'd see numbers like that. These are highly functioning kids from great families, but something is creating a situation where they're just not coping. And our numbers are not unique. We are seeing this at almost every public school, particularly those in our area, because many of them have a large collection of high-functioning kids, but in adolescence in general, we're seeing a huge spike in this whole problem where kids feel they do not have hope. And obviously for us as a Catholic school, inspiring and instilling this concept of hope all right, is very, very important. We often talk about here, if we can get a child to Kairos, great things can happen. But you know what, there's, there's three long years often before we get to Kairos. And that's where we really rely on you to work very closely with our counseling departments uh, and with our administration when you see things happening or you have questions or concerns. And that ha doesn't always happen. Some parents are wonderful at that, but we really need you to reach out to us because you spend some very special and specific time. Our time is a little bit different we often spend, and we need to be partners in identifying those kids that are high at risk because the stakes are just so high. Um, those expectations we put on them, you know, we th one of my coaches the other day talked about being coaching his nine-year-old Little League team the other day, and a brawl broke out between the umpire and one of the fathers. You know, and that's just one picture. This doesn't just happen in athletics, but I think we've all heard over the years where we've gone with our athletics and our parental responses to competition. Competition is important. Um, trying hard and putting in great effort. Winning is important, but also learning how to lose. And one of the concepts I talked with the moms the other night is teaching our kids resiliency and teaching them how to fall forward. We're all going to fall. How do we talk about failing? How do we make failing okay? Because in, you know many of us have learned in our own lives that it is often through our greatest failures that our greatest growth has occurred. And we're a school. Learning to fail allowing our children to fail and managing the edges is often what our role is. Our role should not be swooping in and protecting them from all those moments of failure or struggle. It is supporting them so they can work through those and so they have the resiliency so that when they do go on their own they're able to cope with what life hands to them. And that starts with things like athletics, it starts with things like academics, and it just starts with things like communication and conversation around those issues. Where is the balance? I think Gretchen covered that very, very well. Again, we have highly functioning, exceptional students. We want them involved in great things. We want them building that resume. We want them building that college you know, letter uh, and that college look that uh, is going to get them and, uh, into the college of your dreams. Sometimes maybe our box for those colleges are a little bit small. Sometimes our perception of what is best for that individual needs to be re-examined, and I think some of us need to employ the old Ignatian concept of metanoia, which is a, a, a caring but very, very well thought out and prayerful uh, separation, if you will, okay? A sense of stepping back and thinking about things, and I think we as educators often need to do that in our classrooms. But we as parents, I think, also need to do that in collaboration and say, what's best for this individual? And it may not be that in that box that we perhaps had set out from the beginning. And so 
we're talking about that as a faculty. We're talking about that uh, as administrators. We're certainly talking about that as counselors constantly now, is how do we work with these kids and talk to them so that they can relieve some of that pressure that they're putting upon themselves. And a key point of this that I've mentioned a couple times already is that the school and the parents really have to work together. And please, please do not feel like we are judging you if you contact us with an issue or a problem. We are in the business of forming children. We are in the business of working with you. And the fact is that that's a human reality. And I think the fact is that because we have a religious institution and we have values that tie us down, you know, we are going to keep your family issues uh, very, very much within the counseling department and a need to know circle. And we can help you resource, we can work with you, we can make adjustments to the academic schedule your student may on, be on if it's a serious enough situation. We're very much open and willing to, to help your child create conditions for success. And that's very important to know. All right, I talked a little bit about the, the pathologization of feelings uh, and the fact that they use this language. How do we talk and allow for success and failure with grades, college, relationships, and sports? I want to talk again a little bit about college. We've invested here enormously in the college counseling office. Many of you parents have met with our college counselors either through junior uh, meetings or through your senior process. Uh, one of the things that's really important to understand is the college process has gotten uh, a little bit out of control in my opinion as a principal. Uh, it, it is, there is so much high pressure being placed upon students that how do you as a family manage the stress in that process? How do you manage that conversation? How do you manage the planning process? All right, We have to think about that moving forward and we're very, very happy to help you with that. And that's one of the reasons why we tried to supply a college counseling department so parents didn't feel even more financial pressure to go out and hire a college coach because that even put more pressure because now I'm spending another however many thousands of dollars on that college coach. And the, we have to find the, and place our students in the place where they're going to find the most amount of help. Uh, covered most of the rest of this already. So transitioning to this is a little bit of a jerky transition here to a certain extent, but I want to talk a little bit about STEAM. Uh, in 2010-2011, in President Obama and the, the Federal Department of Education uh, declared that the United States, from a national security standpoint and from uh, a point of national economic health, needed to do a better job of exposing their children and developing students in science, technology, engineering, and math. American engineers historically have been the greatest engineers in the world, particularly from the creativity standpoint. I mean, you can make the argument that Japanese have been great at taking technologies and further engineering them, but the creative elements of that technology has often been developed within the United States. And there was a sense that India, Japan, China, and other countries have begun to overtake the United States in areas of engineering. And many of the engineers out here may have those uh, conversations already at work. What happened since 2011 was this whole concept of STEAM education exploded. As often happens in education, trends occur. And there's always some good kernels in those trends, but sometimes it also turns into a marketing effort. And so what we've tried to do in our visitation of some of the STEAM schools and STEM schools around town in our research, say, what's the best in STEM? What is the best things we can take from the STEM education that's happening around the country? And what are colleges looking at? Because we are a college preparatory school. And what our kids need to be exposed to here at Regis Jesuit? Um, there's a broad reality. We live in a very, very engineering-based economy here in Colorado, from, from uh, natural resource extraction to aerospace. Um, so we have to make some choices. To, we can't do everything that's contained within STEM, but how can we do it well? And one of the things we learned from talking to the universities and colleges was that first and foremost, you still must prepare your students at the theoretical understanding of mathematics and the sciences. All right? And then the other piece is that creativity and design is very, very important. Remember back those success of those American engineers was often based upon their creativity and sense of creative design. Think about Apple in itself. It's not simply a great piece of technology. It also is aesthetically very, very pleasing, which has improved its attractiveness uh, of its products. So design is important. 
So how do we explore those elements of design? Well, we put the A into STEM, and that's where the art comes in. And then we also talk about, okay, what are we doing really well? Well, we have a good chemistry program. We have a good math program. Uh, we have some, some good science courses. Uh, we, we've done a great job in investing in technology over the last four or five years and expanding that. We don't really have engineering. And we haven't really looked at how we can incorporate more project-based learning into those theoretical sciences that we already offer. So what we've done is we've tried to expand our computer offerings and look at uh, future expansion. It's really what you're seeing now is the tip of the spear, if you will. We've got about a five-year uh, STEAM program that we're going to be enrolling over the next five years. Some of it includes new courses. Some of it includes revamping old ones like architecture to be more design driven. So you're looking at CAD like technology and getting that design with the technology element built into the architecture course. And part of it is offering new programs like an academic based robotics course, which is very attractive to a lot of the kids. It feeds into a very successful and growing extracurricular activity. And it, robotics is a great incorporation of all of these STEM elements. There's science in there, there's technology, there's engineering, there's arts and design, all right, and there's mathematics. So robotics is a great embodiment of that. And then looking forward, what else are we going to focus on? Is it going to be that extraction engineering piece? Is it going to be on general engineering concepts? Is it going to be on aerospace? We still have some work to do there, but that's where we're kind of going with the STEM program. And then expanding that project-based component within our existing science courses. Some of that requires more space. It's very tough to do engineering. It's very tough to do project-based learning when you're in classrooms where you have no room and you have no space, where you can make a mess, leave a mess, come back to the mess. Uh, and then also have the tools and pieces for the kids to, to design and play with and build those projects. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about in the strategic plan as far as building facilities. And you can see the lab requirements. The other piece of that is, quite frankly, the girls' labs right now are, are too small for the number of girls that are now in that building. So how could we improve the girls' facilities while at the same time making a cross-campus improvement to science? And one of the concepts that we've come up with, and really our science teachers and math teachers have come up with, is building a single STEM facility where we have that engineering and building space, but we also are able to put our science departments close to one another physically so they can do a lot more cross-sharing and collaboration, and we can be much more on the same page when it comes to sciences so that the girls are getting a lot of what the boys are getting and the boys are getting what the girls are getting. And I think that all, all that, too, is an important concept and really driven from the grassroots, which is great. Gretchen mentioned the, uh, the RJ Way. Part of the RJ Way does fit in really well with STEM because it, it really, within the RJ Way, it talks a lot more about things like proficiency scales and understanding goals and where you are, but it also talks about practicing your learning. Uh, and that really fits in well with STEAM when you start talking about project-based learning, which is exactly what we're trying to do. Take the conceptual and turn it into something that's visual and tactile and that can really help certain types of learners you know, absorb and understand what they're doing in something like a physics or a chemistry experience. Now some schools in town have gone to a, um, some schools have gone to a uh, a STEAM school. They've become a STEAM school. How many people have heard of the STEAM school and DPS? There's a STEAM Academy out in Highlands Ranch. Um, we are not becoming a STEAM school. We are looking at STEAM as an enrichment opportunity uh, because we are a Jesuit school and we have a tradition that we too need to keep alive uh, and that does definitely fit in well with STEAM initiatives. But in order to become a truly STEAM school, we would have to change how we taught everything uh, and integrate all of it into projects-based learning. And we still really feel that there is a place from, for, for very strong theoretical learning, uh, critical analysis, debate, discussion, uh, and some of the things that have been around for a long time in Jesuit education. So we do see this as an enrichment opportunity and an expansion there, but we don't, we're not saying we're going to whole hog become a STEAM school. If you want to talk about that concept and why we went in that direction, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. So as you can see by this slide he put up, I get to talk about the money. 
intensely aware that our tuition is rapidly increasing. And as Tony mentioned, we've developed some five and ten year models as to what happens to our budget and to our, how our fundraising fits in and how our tuition fits in and how do we maintain a, 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 an achievable tuition for the majority of our parents. I don't have an answer to that question right tonight. Uh, but I'm going to give you a look into our budget and how it comes together and then we'll uh, break for some questions. As you can see from the screen, our income uh, primarily comes from our uh, tuition. The increase this year of $850 was 6.2 percent. That's historically in the range of what we've done for the last 20 years, but we are very aware that we're in this 10-year period of $850 increases. And while 6.2 doesn't sound too bad, 850 doesn't sound very good. So the board is engaging in questions of how do we run more efficiently, how do we save money, how do we put money in our priorities, and where are we going down the road. So the tuition increase, uh, tuition income generates a little over uh, $23 million. Then auxiliary income, which is our food service, our bus, our athletic gates, um, uh, the commissions we get on the online book sales, our rental income from our pool and fields, and the parking income all comes together in what we call auxiliary income. Our investment comes off our endowment, and I'll talk about the endowment in a few minutes. Uh, but the endow um, generally we take a three-year average of how our endowment's been doing and we take about a 5% slice from that every year and put it into the operating budget. So where do we get our money? It's from tuition, auxiliary income, and investment income. Now the budget, where do we spend it? Auxiliary uh, activities include really primarily the bus transportation and our food service. Uh, in facilities, that money uh, pays for the keeping up of our grounds, our, our buildings, pays the utility bills, our custodians. Um, they're a third party company that comes in from the outside. They're not Regis employees. The repairs we make on, on, the, on the building and the running of our pool. General and administrative, all right, I'm off a page. Oh, you know what? When you save money and run things on both sides of the paper, you should look on the other side when you're done. So our, these are our main expenses. So I, I was talking about expenses, so I'll come back to that. Um, salary and benefits actually take care of the majority of our budget. Totally, we have a $27 million budget. Uh, almost 16.5 uh, are that's all the salaries of every employee coaching stipends club moderator stipends are all included in that number our education departments are our academic departments math English science PE those kind of uh, departments um, have that amount of money the supporting services are things like the admissions office, graduation, the principal's office, that's the highest of any budget. Um, if you don't laugh at my jokes, we're going to go longer. <laughs> uh, the diversity office, the counseling office, the professional development for our teachers, and uh, the operating budget for our technology department. That all goes into supporting services and supporting the education. Student clubs and activities, you can see there on the screen, and the athletics, the costs, all the budgets for, um, I think we have 13 teams in each division with multiple levels, so it's about 26 teams in each division, uh, the total athletic budget for the operating costs, helmets, uniforms, care of fields, those kind of things. Now we can go back to what I was talking about earlier. So here you see the rest of the expenses. I talked about uh, the first two, general and administrative, are uh, what it costs to run a lot of those supporting services, pay the, or the, the budgets for central administration, the business office, the president's office, my office, um, facilities uh, come in there. Advancement, their operating expenses are um, 115000 our tuition assistance or financial aid, about 25% of our students are on financial aid. This year, you can see that we gave out almost 3.2 million. 
The capital expense is the, main, is the maintaining of our buildings and grounds. So it's all the repair work, special projects, um, new equipment, um, whether it's a trombone or it's a new uh, computer server. All the technology, anything we're buying uh, goes into that capital expense area. We take about $750,000 a year and put it in what we call deferred maintenance. We take 50000 of that and put it in our savings account for the future, and, and the other 700000 goes for replacing windows, replacing roofs. Um, anything major that's over $100,000 is paid uh, by the capital expense budget. Turn it over. Uh, finally, the last expense is our debt service. So we pay about a million dollars every year to pay off our mortgage. When we moved here, um, we had about six million dollars in, in uh, expenses for the development of the property and the original boys division building. Then we went and built a boys division and then the steel center and we uh, bought 27 acres out in the front, uh, which was slated for condos and townhomes back in the day. And each time we've rolled, um, we've refinanced and we roll all of our debt back together and we've continued to pay it off. Those are in tax exempt bonds. They pay a very low interest. I think we're probably about three and a half percent that we're paying on that uh, debt. And it's probably got about 23 more years to pay off that. Um, we do occasionally make additional payments on our debt to get ahead and try to pay it off uh, faster than that, but it's not a major, it's, it's not a, we don't do that every year. So there's about $13 million mortgage on the entire property. I should just look at my computer screen. So uh, in terms of additional income, uh, comes from our advancement office. And I think we have some of our advancement staff here, so thank you very much. Thank you for all the work you do. You can see at the bottom there, they raise about $1.8 million every year to help us balance the budget. That comes from a variety of events and activities that you all uh, know and many of you go to. Uh, you can see the breakdown there. Primarily, this funding goes to help us pay the financial aid bill that exists uh, in the operating budget that you saw a few minutes ago. So 1.8 million, um, it goes all into the bucket, but we try to earmark it to pay as much as we can for the financial aid. Ultimately, our goal is to raise as much money out through our annual fund and other projects to fund the entire financial aid um, expense, but that's a huge deal. Next year, in our, in our current budget right now, we're slated to give out $4 million in financial aid. The dramatic increase of that is trying to reach out to middle income families who um, just don't see that they can pull it off and send their children here, um, and we want to encourage them to apply. We had a 22% increase in financial aid awarded to freshmen. Uh, current students, we're not anticipating a full amount, uh, that same amount, but it's going to go up. And hopefully that'll keep middle income parents considering Regis Jesuit High School. So, what I've talked about so far, um, you see our income up there of a little over 25 million, our total expense, we add in our uh, fundraising income. And so this year's operating surplus is $283,000. That's my bonus, right? <laughs> um, what does that go for? Uh, that goes for several things. Uh, we many times have unplanned expenses. We have a chapel renovation that's going to happen this summer, and we were wondering where we're going to get the money, and we're going to get a, a portion of that from that kind of money. Um, we may have an emergency expense, a blown server, uh, you know, we may, it's just unexpected, unintended expenses. I, I probably would expect that would go down a couple hundred thousand and we'll probably end the year with a slight surplus. Uh, the endowment right now is $11.7 million. And in addition to that, we have uh, an emer what we call an emergency cash uh, fund, and it's also kind of a cash management account. 
what our Board of Trustees and our Audit and financing, uh, Finance Committee has uh, decided recently is we want to keep a three-month reserve for uh, catastrophes um, or really big unexpected things that we don't know how to fund. Right now we spend about two million dollars a month on all of our expenses and this would give us a three-month uh, cushion. Might be a dramatic loss of students, it might be that we hired a lot of teachers that have a lot of experience and we didn't budget enough for their salaries. It might be a, some kind of repair in, in, the, in the building. So we're trying to keep it there as our rainy day fund. That cash reserve fund actually will increase so when a lot of people pay their tuition in the beginning of the year, that could go up to seven, eight, or nine million dollars and then as we pay bills and don't have the money for it out of our operating daily fund, we go to the cash reserve. But we have about six million in there now and that's, uh, that's the bottom where we want to keep it and not touch that corpus. As you know, another example where we might spend it, um, we're trying to fund all the STEAM expenses and uh, Alan and Gretchen are working on a three to five year budget and rather than just jacking up tuition we can go, one of our options is to go into this fund and take a couple hundred thousand dollars and fund the things that they need, especially that trip to Hawaii. So that puts together the entire budget. We have two savings accounts, the endowment and the emergency fund. The operating budget generally is balanced if we were f have three more budget meetings to f try to finish out next year. Generally we don't end up with a surplus like 283,000. Generally it's either close to zero in it, or it could be as high as about a $50,000 cash surplus at the beginning of the year. And that gives us a little protection for emergency funds or if five more students don't enroll that said they were, uh, we don't have to go into panic mode. Uh, just a quick end to this, uh, I also am involved in the planning. Tony touched on uh, the facility planning for the future. We have three different work groups that are trying to design what might the future facilities look like. One of them is an athletic renovation, which would be uh, in the stadium. It would look at lights, seating, locker rooms, weight rooms, restrooms, concessions, and an increase in a dram fairly dramatic but not overly dramatic amount of seats. We're talking about possibly moving the home stands to the west side and have about 2,500 seats over there, leave the, uh, the east side for the visitors, and um, then accommodate um, better because if you've been to a big game there's people everywhere and we don't have enough bathrooms, concessions, parking or anything else. The steam or the steam classrooms and labs and then we will if we build this other facility that Alan was talking about we're going to empty out some spaces in the in the building and we possibly could use that for uh, some central administration spaces and some additional classrooms. The two modular units that we have up above are on a five-year lease and I think we're in year three so we got to get going uh, but realistically I can extend that. When would we start all this building? Well once it has to be it has to be approved we have, it has to go through a whole vetting process of what these buildings really are and how big are they um, and, and then we probably shrink, shrink it and twist it and try to make it as efficient as we can. That's probably going to take place over next year. Then our uh, advancement staff have to gear up for a capital campaign. Then we have to raise the money. Then we have to collect the money. And then we have to build the building. So we're realistically probably three to five years out before we can actually do any of this. So that is our presentation for the night. We're going to open it up for questions in a, in a second, but I want to thank uh, Stephanie Laurenti, Patrick Britty, Josh Van Bramer, and True Potter, who are the students out, out tonight broadcasting this out to the entire world, and I'm sure they're all tuned in. Uh, Adam Dawkins and Aldo Pantoja are the uh, teachers who are here to um, help us out. So how about a round of applause for them? Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have about a half an hour for questions, but uh, let me close with a prayer and then we'll open up with uh, questions. Alan reminded me that I didn't open with a prayer. Uh, so, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the gifts that you give us. 
for the teachers, the students who show up every day willingly most of the time uh, to, to grow and to learn, for the parents who entrust their kids to us, uh, for the great opportunity to live in Colorado and enjoy your beauty. So much we talk about the things that we don't have or the problems that we have, but please remind us and uh, all the people who love us and support us and that we remember those in the good times and the bad. Thank you. Amen. So let's, uh, they're going to bring their chairs up. And uh, Stephanie is our Twitter uh, person who's going to yell out if we have a Twitter question. So feel free to email or Twitter in if you're there. Um, and then uh, I'll try to point you out uh, if you have a question, and Stephanie will come over. So let me give that to Tony, and you can pass the mic around. So we don't have any um, Twitter questions yet, but we just sent out a message to um, Twitter to get them, and we're watching closely to get them. Uh, my name is Kate Smith. My daughter Quinn is a freshman in the girls division and I read something recently that the diocese did an audit, an interview, an assessment and I saw some of the changes and I'd like your comments on how what they decided will affect what happens here in the next three years and then my backup question is why is it that although we're increasing the diversity in the student body, I haven't seen a whole lot of diversity in the faculty and staff. And maybe those two things are tied together. I don't know. Thank you. Okay, sure. Sure, I'll start with the, uh, the second part. Um, first of all, we have jobs open, so if you know anybody, let us know. Uh, it, you know, it is not from the lack of trying, um, honestly. Uh, it is, uh, if you work in any of the public districts, they have the same issue right now. Uh, we certainly have been able to hire more Latino uh, folks, uh, which is a, a bigger and growing population in Colorado. Uh, Mr. Pantoja, uh, Mr. Gallegos, uh, and, and, and a few others. Um, which certainly helps because that's a growing community that we're serving too. Um, but there is, I think every educational district in the country is looking for uh, more African American and other cultural groups, uh, Native American for example groups uh, in education. The result is the level of incredible choice that those folks have when qualified uh, and the competitiveness. Um, and that's what we're facing from our standpoint is um, the, the number of applicants we're getting in those areas, even when we've recruited, uh, has been very small. Uh, and that makes it very, very challenging. So we, over the last two years, and that's one of the reasons why in the strategic planning you have a chief diversity officer that was the CDO stood for, what is suggested to be an, a, a possible choice uh, to get that issue more forefront within the management team conversation and start creating structures to assist that. Uh, but again, we're still not completed that strategic plan, so we don't have those structures in place. But honestly, it is right now from a lack of applications uh, and a lack of connectivity to some communities um, who have their own directions and communities that they're serving, how do we get them to come into our community uh, and be part of this wonderful institution? So there definitely are challenges there. I just want to add, uh, since Alan brought up the CDO, uh, that's really part of the organizational assessment work that we're doing and that will be taking place over the next year. So I would expect by the spring of next year, we should have a, a really good feel for what the organization looks like here at Regis going forward for the next five to ten years and part of that will be assessing the need for a chief diversity officer. So we have an ongoing conversation with the Archdiocese. Um, the Archbishop had a desire, um, I'm sure wherever he goes, people ask him about a lot of things and one of them is uh, the, the Catholic schools and how, did he feel, how does he feel about them. 
and he really didn't know a whole lot about us, just things that he heard. So the six Catholic high schools, two archdiocesan, four uh, private independent schools, um, had a visit from a team. They were different teams that went to each school. One person was common throughout the six visits who spent about two days in each school to try to get a sense of the community, uh, the, the religious nature of the school. Uh, they met with a lot of employees, met with all of our theology teachers, and uh, we provided a very thick background material for them to read. And then uh, the report that we've referenced in the recent emails came out. Uh, there are some recommendations specifically for Regis Jesuit High School, and there are some recommendations uh, in the Denver Catholic that replied to all the schools. Um, so I would say that it's happened because of a lack of knowledge, really, of what's going on in the Catholic schools and a desire to know. And, you know, everybody talks rumors, and um, so it's, it's good that we had a visit. Over the last 10 years, there's probably been a degradation of the communication between the archdiocese and the schools. Um, it just happened, especially with the high schools, where more of the focus was on the elementary schools, so things kind of drifted apart. So one of the benefits that's happening is that uh, we're communicating more, uh, we're getting to know one another. The superintendent's going to come and, and tour the school with me in two weeks and we'll introduce them to students and some teachers and give them a sense of what's going on. Uh, there are some recommendations that, that they're making that we're in a discussion as to really, do we have to do that? And uh, is that really within your jurisdiction or is it the jurisdiction of the provincial and the Jesuits? So we'll, we'll tussle on a few things. Uh, for example, um, one of the things they published in the Denver Catholic was that every speaker who would come to school um, had to be vetted through the Archdiocesan Office, and we understand that's important to do with uh, theology speakers, but not in history and English and social studies, and we have an alumni speaker series and that don't touch on things that directly are the Archbishop's responsibility. I think the main thing is uh, that he's talking about is that we make sure we're closely aligned with the uh, the U.S. Catholic bishops have a guideline for the theology curriculum. It's a sequence and topical uh, document that explains what they feel should be taught in high schools. Uh, uh, we think we're doing better than they think we're doing because we just had a two-page course syllabus that they tried to draw these conclusions from, and I think the superintendent's very open in saying, you know, this is just two pages, let's find out more. Uh, our department chairs met uh, two days ago, or I think it was two days ago, uh, with all the theology teachers to talk about the report and say, hey, look, this is the primary focus. What do you think? And the reports that I'm hearing from that meeting were, yeah, we want to be in line, and you know, yeah, this is a good idea, and we do this, but we do it here instead of here. So I think there's a real desire and openness of our theology teachers to be in concert with the bishop's guidelines. Um, I think we're pretty close. The two department chairs, when talking to Gretchen and Alan and myself, said we're, we're probably 85, 90 percent there. It's just some of these little things or things they didn't see. So that's a big focus, and I think it's the prime. Realistically, if you're the archbishop, you want to know this is a Catholic school, and and teaching kids about their faith and uh, and going out and living it. Uh, we had a great visit. I was totally awed by the, the theology teachers' uh, conversations with the visiting team. The parents were awesome. Uh, one of our parents uh, said, um, you know, I have two children. One daughter's at, uh, in Columbia in New York City, and I have a son here who's now. When, when my kids were younger, they were Catholic because I told them to be Catholic. Uh, but what happened while they were at Regis, the Jesuits uh, taught them about their faith and how to live it, and, and they chose, they're now, ha have chosen that for themselves because that's what they want. To me, it was like, hallelujah, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And if you're not Catholic, our goal is to do the same, but in your faith. that you, I, I jokingly said uh, back in the day that a non-Catholic kid would come home and say, Mom, the Catholics, the crazy Catholics do this, what do we do? Well, that's the conversation we want to have happening. And they can understand their traditions and their faith and live that out. So I think we're there. I'm not really afraid of what's going on. I think it can be a positive thing. 
Um, there's a few things that we'll tussle over in the report, but most of it, it's, um, it's fine. We, they had a rating scale of about eight or ten things, and we met expectations on all of them. And uh, we exceeded on one, which was the service, our community service aspect. The other major thing they would like us to see is spend more time on uh, teaching our faculty the doctrine of the church. And, the, and so we do, what they said is we do a great job with developing the spirituality and how to pray and how to live your faith and, and go into liturgy and all those pieces. But they, the, the knowledge part they feel we should do more in. We do some of it, but they want us to do more. And you know, our response was, sure, we can do that. We also don't want to take people away from their local parish. Uh, so we want them to be engaged there and engaged here. Those were the two, those two were the biggest things. So nothing to fear. Uh, the superintendent uh, said to me, he said, you know, there's some people who think that Jesuit and Catholic are diametrically opposed. He said, I'm not of that ilk. I believe they're the same church and in the same principles. So I think we have a positive feeling there and they're gonna respect the charism of the Jesuits and we'll move forward. Uh, but is it a big deal? Yeah, it's the first time it's been ever done, uh, but hopefully it'll give uh, the Archbishop and his staff the confidence that we're here and we're doing a great job for the church and for the kids of this area. Another question. we have anything on Twitter? Nothing yet. Oh my goodness. It must be a bunch of 40-year-olds uh, listening. Um, my name's Tracy Kelly O'Neill. My daughter, my uh, son, I do not have a daughter. Um, Jimmy is a, a junior. He's my one and done child. So um, my husband is a legacy of Regis. Um, and you could probably spend hours talking about the tuition costs. But my concern, I guess, and you kind of alluded to it when you talk about middle class. And middle class is kind of a, it's a, what is a middle class? But I, and my child's been brought up in the Catholic, the Archdiocese of Denver Catholic school system. So when you look at a 6.2% increase over the years, and you look at middle class families, and you look at the cost of Regis tuition, which tuition is actually more expensive than just tuition at CU Boulder. And you know, we're gonna have to educate our child and help him out in college. Um, and you're giving more grant, more aid next year. How are you gonna continue to cover that increase and still attract middle class families when you're giving more aid? I mean, it's kind of a, it seems like you're on a, a it's, on a hamster wheel, it's how are you ever going to answer that question in terms of getting the middle class, controlling tuition? Because you know, I, I went to Catholic schools, and when I went, it was extremely expensive. But I look at what I paid to go to St. Mary's Academy in my day compared to what Regis and St. Mary's Academy are now, and it just floors me. And I understand money, you know, everything's mm -hmm. gone up, but. When you're looking at 15.5 next year, you know, to, to educate my child, that is, you know, it's going to be a $60,000 um, education to put him through Regis. That to me is, that blows my mind. It does. Thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is the dilemma. And we're, uh, we're concerned. We don't want to become a school uh, where the tuition is so high that uh, only an exclusive group of people can come, and then only the poorest can come because they have financial aid. Um, we're trying to pay our teachers a living wage so they can be teachers. Talked to a teacher the other day who's considering moving to the public schools because they have a better retirement plan. Uh, there's another teacher moving back to Illinois because they can't afford housing here in Denver. There's no clean answer to that. Um, we really are reaching out to our alumni, but right now less than 10% of our alumni write a check to Regis of any size. That's a dollar to many dollars. So we, the average Jesuit school across the country, about 25% of the, uh, their alumni make a donation. So we have to double what we're bringing in now and we're on track to raise about donations from about 12% of our alumni. Uh, if you're a past parent who has their last child here, um, you know that we send you things at home for your older son or daughter. We never let you go. And a lot of past parents do donate. Um, you charge an actual cost. 
and it that goes up and then the fundraisers have to go to work on on whether it's buildings or repairs or what there's no I, I wish if I could give you the answer tonight I would but we're extremely sensitive and concerned about where this is going and and how do we have a diverse population from all walks of life in all, all areas it Father Sheridan, when he was here, was predicting that in eight to 10 years, the number of students on financial aid would double, which would mean $8 million. And, you know, I, where do we get that $8 million from? Every school, private school in the country has it. Uh, we're trying to be modest and we look at our organizational efficiency. Uh, we look at every budget and is it really what we need to do? Um, we have rising expectations for parent from parents and kids who say, you know, I pay $15,000. I, I want value for that $15,000. So it's a challenge. Um, I hope what we're doing, um, you're proud of what we're doing and that we're creating men and women with and for others who can go on and be success, successful and live their faith and are confident people. Um, that's worth a lot of uh, that's worth a lot of tuition. Uh, my daughters didn't go to uh, Regis. It was before we had girls, and and they're talking about sending their kids here because they they see what it could bring us. So we have to cut. We have to limit expenses, and we have to raise income, and we have to charge less. I don't know how we're going to do that. Add a couple thoughts. Uh, first of all, I graduated from Regis in 1980, and tuition here was $500 a semester when I went to school here, which is amazing. I mean, it was a struggle for my, I mean, it wasn't a struggle, but, um, uh, you know, at the time, $500 a semester was a lot of money, so 15000 a year is crazy. But I, you can't eat an elephant one uh, more than one bite at a time, and this is a big problem, and we do talk about it at every board meeting. And honestly, I think the answer over the long term is getting our alumni to participate, as you mentioned, in the school and, and giving back. Uh, we're currently, I think, slightly below 10%. Uh, but that's up. I mean, we've, we now have, uh, we've gone from like 5% to 10% participation from our alumni. There's a huge base of alumni out there that we've got to go after. And uh, they're benefiting from their religious education, and uh, we're, we need to get them to give back. And then specifically, I think our endowment needs to grow. And it has grown. I, I mean, it's gone from a few million dollars to $11 million in a fairly short period of time. Our advancement group has done a great job. But we're in the lowest quartile of Jesuit high schools across the country when you look at endowment. And there are a lot of reasons for that, which we, we don't need to get into. Uh, but we are moving in the right direction, and when we take 5% of that every year, that's the $580,000 that was on the financial slides that Rick went through. We need to get that, we need to quadruple that number quickly. We need to get $2 million a year out of endowment, but you're only going to do that when you get an endowment to 30, 40, or $50 million. And over time, we can do that, but it's, it's going to take time for that to happen. So that was an answer. Yeah. Maybe they'll Twitter then if they can't hear me. Uh, as a parent, maybe the question is, what do you value most at Regis? And what would you keep here? And what would you reduce? And because expenses is a part of that. We're a $27 million operation. So what's most important? And that's a challenge because if your son plays football, your daughter swims, uh, you want a bigger stadium or a new pool versus, you know, and so we're trying to juggle all these uh, expectations. So what do you really value or do you want us to do it all? And if you want us to do it all, then there's a cost to that. So other questions? Yes. Um, so first off, I'm a little, uh, let me start with, um, what's, our, what's our cost per student? as far as our budget per student? Well, part of that uh, depends on what you figure into the cost per student. But right now, with the total budget that I 
showed you, uh, the cost per student is $1,100 higher than the tuition that we're charging this year. Yeah, I, I, what is that number? Uh, four, so we're paying four. Well, next year it would be fifteen five plus eleven hundred, so just under seventeen. Right, and and how I I'd be curious how that compares to um, to a other Jesuit schools and b other um, religious private schools, a la Mullen and those sort of places. I suspect that's pretty high. Um, you mean the cost per student? Yeah. Well, you know, the best way to compare that probably is just looking at, at tuition. Um, you know, Mullins tuition is a little lower than ours. I don't know what their gap is, but I'm sure they probably have one. Uh, St. Mary's is a little higher than us. And that's primarily due to class size and teacher salaries. So we're... I can get that answer for you. I don't want to misspeak in terms of where we are. If you compare all Jesuit schools, it's really not fair to compare New York City and Washington, D.C. to Denver, Colorado. Um, so um, there's some really big expensive tuitions uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and Boston. Um, and then you all go all the way down to Creighton Prep in Omaha, where the cost of living is much lower. So we're above a Creighton Prep. Um, I'm sorry, you're, you're missing my point. Yeah. The, the point in the way of a budget is how much does it cost per student to be here? I understand the tuition issue, but if you're looking from a budgetary standpoint, the only way you're going to cut costs is you have to have, you spend less per student here. And I'm a little surprised that, I mean, if you look up at your master plan, for example, um, I find it pretty odd that expanding the stadium would be one of the biggest issues for the school when in fact the football stadium and overfilling that stadium is probably an issue five nights a year. Um, that seems like a really unusual priority to me. Uh, Tony, I was in the class of 79, I was here when you were, and I think <clears throat> at that time, particularly in the terms of um, athletics and um, those sorts of things, I think we sort of prided ourselves uh, doing more with less. And um, building the ultimate campus from an athletic standpoint, I, mean, I think our facilities are, are great, but <clears throat> I'm not so sure that expanding the stadium for five nights a year would be um, where my priority would be in spending the money. And I don't think that, I was, I was shocked to hear that 6% a year for 20 years has been what the increase has been. Um, when you look at cost of living and, and any other standards, that's well above any, any sort of standard. So that's not making a lot of sense to me either. And I completely agree that, that keeping middle class kids able to come here um, is an issue. And I think the teacher salary issue, I don't think perhaps, if you look at any business model, they don't look at necessarily decreasing the salaries of the employees, but they look at decreasing the number of employees in order to compensate the ones they have. But every company who has financial issues, they, they figure out ways to cut staff or, or decrease the amount of employees. I don't know if that's been considered or not. Well, so that's, that's a lot. Part, yeah, that's part of the, that's part of the uh, organizational structure that we're studying right now is What's, the most, what's an efficient way to still deliver the services as best we can and maintain the identity of the school. So it is part of it. Uh, the things that I put up on the screen may or may not happen. Uh, you know, we're, we're going through a planning process now saying, what are the needs that we're hearing from people and uh, how can we solve those needs? Then we'll go and say, what, what are they gonna cost? We may not be able to expand the stadium, but I can tell you that uh, we don't have enough locker rooms for all the kids to change their clothes, um, which includes showers and all those kind of things. We do, the, we do use the stadium. Football is the biggest draw. Uh, the, the facility can't handle the amount of people that we have now, so we have to do something. Now, it might be something simpler, but having more it doesn't make sense to rent stands that you put on the south end and they dig holes in the, 
in the uh, blacktop and we have to repave that on a continual basis. We, we, we want to have a facility that we can use. Uh, so there's a whole process over the next year to decide what we're going to build and can we afford it and can we maintain it and can we raise the money for it and those discussions will happen. Okay, uh, and my, I guess the one other question I have sure. is um, the enrollment has been going up every year and the number of applicants is going up every year. So I'm curious, what's the need for rebranding or what's, where are we going with that when in fact we have more applicants and more enrollees every year? What is the rebranding issue? I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the plan is. So I want to circle back, though, first of all, and talk a little bit about the facilities issue, because not only do we have to go through the approval process, as Rick talked about, generally when you build a facility, you do a fundraiser specifically for the facility. And yeah, there are ongoing operating costs associated with keeping the facility in use that probably does flow into the tuition. But typically, when you build a facility, you finance it through a, a fundraising program. So that's number one. And then number two on the 6.2% uh, increase, I talked about the fact that we had to take teacher salaries from the low 70% to where we're at today, which is about 90 to 91% of competition, so that we can pay a living wage. Uh, the great majority of that 6.2% over that period has gone to making sure we have competitive salaries for our teachers. So I wanted to make those two points. Then on the branding issue, um, you know, we know that Catholic school enrollment is going down. And it's not a slow trickle, it's actually a pretty significant decrease, which is disappointing. But that was where we got the majority of our students. Uh, and as that goes down, we have to increase the feeder school population that feeds their schools into Regis. I mentioned that uh, we had 12, I think it was 12 new additional feeder schools in this year's freshman class, so the class that's currently here as a freshman, uh, directly as a result of trying to uh, do a better job communicating the RJ brand and reaching out to more feeder schools and really connecting. We're going to need to continue to do that because our uh, traditional uh, supply of students through the Catholic schools, it's going down, it's dwindling, which is disappointing, but it's a fact. Uh, so that's all I would say about the brand and why we think we need to make it stronger, not only in the communities where we currently exist, but in the communities where we need to go so that we can continue to get 1,650 kids in here um, every year. So Alan, you wanted to add to that? Just give us some numbers. Um, last year was the first year we flipped the public school uh, or non-Catholic school to Catholic school ratio in applicants uh, and those accepted. Um, we used to be able to rely on that low-hanging fruit coming from the parochial school system. Uh, just from the boys level alone, we've lost 55 to 75 traditional applications. Now think of that out of a pool of say just over 400 to 430 applications. Uh, that's a significant number for one single class where those boys don't no longer exist where they did exist three years ago. That trend is not, is not changing. Now what does that mean? That means that our number of feeder schools in the last few years has gone up from like 65 different feeder schools to 72 feeder schools kind of back and forth. We're now looking at way over 80 feeder schools. We're trying to get Catholic kids or aren't going to Catholic schools. We're also trying to get kids that aren't going to a private school or a, a, uh, a current Catholic school. That means that our brand, which is strong within the parochial and Catholic community, does not really work anymore in a changing marketplace. And our admissions directors have had to change the way they go out and talk to families. It used to be the nice easy trip to the parochial school. The kids would all come in the eighth grade. You'd sit down. The admissions directors would bring some of our boys or girls. They'd have a great conversation. They'd give the admissions packets. You're done. We're now having to go out to libraries uh, and community centers to have those conversations to get to those families. And then we're also trying to get to families that are in other private schools and independent schools that are not traditionally coming here, that traditionally went to Kent or, or other schools. Many of them are Catholics, but they're not, this is not traditionally where they have gone. Uh, and that changes the equation as well. So I think that there is a need there because we're needing to connectivity to increase and knowledge of our brand to increase with schools beyond our traditional circle. 
And I just want to say in addition to that, that we can't take our numbers for granted. We're blessed right now to have the numbers that we do, but that honestly could change like that. And that's why we have to be out there and we have to be visiting places. We can't get into the public schools, but as Alan said, we go into the charters, we go into any place that will let us in, we go and do sessions in libraries. We have to keep doing that. So we did get a question in from Twitter, right. and I, it, right now we have a crew at the RJ Lacrosse game against Creek, and we are tied 5-5 and going into overtime, so yay. Um, but that's probably why we don't have many questions right now. <laughs> so um, the question says, could you explain why arts are lumped together with science, technology, engineering, and math? Well, I don't know if I agree with the word lumped, uh, but I think that the arts, which is a long, has a long history within Jesuit education, I think any of you who have seen the mural on the hallway would know that. Um, the, the component, as I said when I was talking, is that the aesthetic realm, uh, which art, arts fits right in, the design realm with arts fits right in, has a natural connectivity that science, technology, and engineering, um, which is not connected with the aesthetic, uh, is missing a piece, is missing an element, and can be enhanced. And I think that arts itself can also be enhanced because if you know, go through many of the techniques that our arts teachers teach, uh, there is engineering in sculpture, uh, there is chemistry in painting, uh, and so th there is the ability to build on those two, those, those areas, because there is natural connectivity. Uh, and to deny that connectivity, I think, is, is to not be really truthful about where those two things can enhance. Okay, we can take a couple more and then we'll end. Anything else? Okay, well, th thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks, gentlemen and ladies, for all your work today. And if today was helpful, shoot me an email and say it was great. Uh, or if you're home and you want to let us know what it was like to view it from home, please let us know. And whether you think this should be an annual kind of event, we're happy to do that. So thank you all very much for coming. You want to what? It's the checks in the mail. <laughs> all right, thank you very much.